Up next, do scientists really need dead sharks? And in our Shark Bite, we'll find out a way that you can get involved in shark science. You're listening to the Shark Week Podcast. G'day, and welcome to Shark Week, the podcast. I'm your host, Luke Tipple, and today we'll find out if we need to kill sharks in the name of science. Now, before we get too deep into things, make sure you subscribe to this channel, like the video, and ring the little bell so you never miss another one of our weekly podcasts. Now, I'm sure we could all agree that science should be based on facts, ethics, morals, and perhaps a higher calling to understand our planet. I'd also like to believe that we live in a world where scientists choose the most effective and non-damaging techniques to study sharks. But in the past, that often hasn't been possible. Much of what we know about sharks today has come from destroying sharks. Now, that's a sad and horrible fact, but it's true. And now I don't mean to imply that scientists are going out willy-nilly and destroying sharks all over the planet. Many of these carcasses have come from accidental bycatch. But not a small number of them have come from targeted killing or unintentional lethality caused by techniques that are, frankly, outdated. Right now, we're at a point where many species of shark are globally threatened. And even when a species of shark is not on the endangered species list, the message sent by media surrounding, for example, shark tournaments that haul in massive sharks for trophies and say they're doing it in the name of science, it conveys, in my opinion, the wrong message. And I think it's time for a change. With me today are two guests that will help shed light on this subject. First up is Neil Hammerschlag. He was a longtime professor at the University of Miami, He's the founder of Atlantic Shark Expeditions, and he's a faculty member of the Black Girl Dies Foundation. He's an expert on, among many other things, data acquisition in the field. So, Neil, welcome to Shark Week, the podcast. You are kind of the creme de la creme of scientists around here. Tell us, how do we study sharks today? Um, For me, I think there is no one answer. uh, There's no one tool. And a really good scientist is going to have multiple tools in their toolkit. A lot of people think, oh, you got to tag the sharks. But there's actually a lot of tools in the scientist's tool belt. And in fact, I've done a lot of work on just observation. And I'm bringing that up because I think observation is actually a kind of a lost art of science. Sure. Now, there has been some sort of perhaps controversy, certainly press, uh, involving scientists taking shark carcass for, for research purposes. And whether they want to actually take them or not, it's been used as justification for certain harvesting that's going on. How often do scientists actually need to kill a shark to learn something about them? My view is that it's probably not as necessary as you as you think. It's really important to try to develop non-invasive or non-lethal ways to study sharks, particularly ones that are uh, relatively rare um, or you know threatened with extinction. Let's take it from the perspective of, you know, science and where we are today and how we've gotten here. How much of that is a product of destructive methodologies? Historically, most of what was large about sharks were from dead animals that were, you know, captured during fishing techniques. And that's still pretty common just because of how expensive and hard it is to actually go out and find animals in the first place. Sure. Um, So do you, in your own research or in research you've been connected with, um, do you use methodologies that involve removing a shark from the water? Yes. And what type of duress does that put the shark under? So the benefit of why you might capture a shark and actually take it out of the water is because it's a lot easier to work with and it makes the process a lot quicker. So the thoughts that, that I always have is like, if you can reduce your handling time, mm. you, can, you can obviously, that's better for the animal, you know, uh, and also safer for the researcher. So you know, when the animal's staying in the water, sometimes it's a lot harder, it takes longer, and you're restricted in, in what you can do. And it, and that increased handling time can be also be stressful for the animal. So the other things about it, what I've learned over the years is that different species actually respond differently. Some species um, like the great hammerhead and other hammerhead species, we've, we discovered that they're extremely sensitive. Uh, we couldn't you, we couldn't even restrain them, let alone take them out of the water. We couldn't restrain them for any marketable amount of time. It, it used to be we said, okay, 45 minutes or less, we would work them up. Um, if they're on the line 45 minutes or less, we, 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 would, we could process them. And what we learned is sometimes that wasn't enough. They didn't live. Under what premise would you say that somebody has justification for, for terminating a fish, you know, a shark? 
you know, there is only certain information you can get from sacrificing sharks. But, you know, when it comes to marine mammals, like, we don't sacrifice marine mammals to study them. No one would start killing orcas to learn what their reproductive state is. So how do we study them? And it turns out there, there were non-lethal tools available for other species that people really care about. You know, big, fluffy, cuddly species. People didn't go kill them when they wanted to learn about them because they developed non-lethal tools. And what we see is the community has responded. There are now non-lethal methods to studying these animals, which is really amazing because they weren't available historically. Do you think that was just because people weren't being inventive enough or was there a, a, a bias towards the animal that enabled scientists to be like, yeah, you know, killing one is worth the sacrifice, whereas they wouldn't have done that to an elephant? Uh, one of, uh, you know, one of my arguments that I made in that scientific paper was that there's a lot of dead sharks out there. They're yeah. being caught in fisheries. Use those. You mm. know, that if there's things that you can only use from dead sharks, why don't you rely on some of the sharks that are already being killed? And is there anything stopping scientists from doing that? So right now, there, there are no barriers to, to working with fishermen uh, or, or fishers to use sharks that are already dead. I would say one of the big barriers is that a lot of fishers have a mistrust of science mm. uh, because they think that information that's going to be gathered from the specimens that they generate are going to kind of kind of come back to bite them in the butt, that there might be increased regulation. And so there's this yeah. general mistrust of scientists. Yeah. You know what I think? I think there's a lot of scientists who are actually pretty bad fishermen. They don't know how to use fishing tackle properly and they, they don't know how to take an animal without it being injured. So in talking to these people who might seem a little distasteful to scientists sometimes who are out there like, oh, I'm catching a shark and I'm going to pull it in and bloody deck this and bloody deck that. Those are the guys who actually do know how to pull them in and release them unharmed if you gave them Absolutely. that opportunity. Absolutely. And have a, have a dialogue. Absolutely. My boat captain right now in Nova Scotia, the one that we're doing the white shark research with, he was a shark fisherman for 25 years. Tremendous yeah. amount of knowledge. And in fact, one of his best phrases he always likes to remind me is that um, he always says that a scientist can give you the square root of a pickle jar, but he can't open it. <laughs> I think he's dead on with that. So we started this podcast with the idea of, you know, do we need to kill sharks to learn about them? What's your answer to that? No, I don't think we need to kill sharks to learn from them. Uh, in fact, I don't even think we need to tag sharks to learn from them. I think it depends what you want to learn. Mm. So what people have done is, for example, looked at tissues that historically were, were the golden standard and taken through lethal means, like, for example, a, a liver or, or heart sample, and then compared that to values in like a fin clip or a muscle biopsy. Mm. And they can figure out what the relationship is between concentrations of toxins or chemicals in those non-lethal methods and compare it to the lethal methods to figure out, oh, you know what? There's there's this certain type of relationship. And now looking at values in the liver, comparing it with values, you know, in the blood, and then saying, oh, now I know what that means. And now I can all I will only work with the blood and therefore don't have to go kill any more sharks. Makes a lot of sense. In Australia, if we want to know if your liver's working good, we just take you out drinking. <laughs> <laughs> to continue this conversation, my next guest is Frederick Buell. He's a world champion freediver and he is awesome. His methods of tagging and gathering information from sharks have had real world results in the protection and preservation of endangered species. Now, Fred, welcome to the Shark Week podcast. It's really good to see you again, dude. I think the last time I saw you, we were underwater in Guadalupe, surrounded by great white sharks. Yeah, that was back in 2009. Was it that long ago? Yeah. Stab long ago. Wow, dude. Okay. Yeah. Well, I wanted to bring you on today to talk about your freediving work specifically with tagging sharks because it's kind of a niche that you've really carved out for yourself. I know that you know a lot of us use spear guns and stuff underwater, but you specifically have achieved some fairly unique results. So the idea when we uh, tag sharks, we need to tag specific individuals. And that's where freediving comes very handy because usually to tag sharks, you have to fish them out of the water. And it's a, a guess because you never know which animal you're going to get. By freediving, I can choose exactly the animal I'm going to tag. So it can be a small male, a large female, a pregnant female. That's what the marine biologists are asking me to do. And to do that, I use the freediving skills. And when you freedive, you know, you're very silent. So you can approach the animal. You can even get them couriers to come to you. And that's the best situation, of course, because then you don't have to run behind the animal to tag it. 
Well, ex- explain that. How are you getting the shark curious about you and getting him coming towards you? Uh, because somehow you're very silent. You're going to stop and wait. And then the, the sharks will come and they are curious because you, you are something they don't know. So they will approach very slowly and try to gauge you. And uh, that's when you have uh, a better time to, to place your shot and, and really being accurate. So that's uh, what I, I try to achieve, to get the animal curse instead of following the animal. Yeah. So if we're going to talk about results, you know, kind of comparing, we've been talking about more traditional methods of tagging a shark. It's potentially fairly traumatic for the animal. Um, in terms of results, what is the comparison between your methodology and more traditional sort of hook and line float type methodologies? In fact, it depends on the team because some teams are, are quite reluctant to use divers or free diver because they are afraid that uh, the tag won't be inserted properly and they will lose tags. Yeah, yeah, because it doesn't penetrate deep enough or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But with the results we have, basically, there's like probably 10-15% of the tag that don't stay in the animal. Okay. And it's almost the same rate when you fish and hook. So there's not much difference. I think one of the, the things that you noted that was really significant to me is the selectivity of what you're doing yes you know being able to go and select the certain kind of animal have you seen any data that couldn't have been achieved by other traditional means and by that i mean like if somebody's saying hey i specifically want to study a you know 14 foot gravid tiger shark um that would be an extremely difficult and perilous thing to do because you'd be injuring that animal. If you actually managed to hook it, it'd probably, you know, be traumatized. It might lose its pups. I don't know if you've ever done anything exactly like that, but is there any data that you've collected that is extremely unique that wouldn't have been gotten in any other way? Uh, Yes, we can take the example of the pregnant female uh, scalloped hammerhead. Uh, Okay. We've been tagging in uh, Galapagos or uh, Malpelo Island in, in Colombia. Uh, in Malpelo, we, the, the first three, four expedition that did there, we specifically targeting these big females because we wanted to see where they're going to have the pups. And we saw that these females were going on the, on the mainland, on the coast, in the mangrove. And thanks to that, uh, to this data, they could protect part of the coast where these animals were giving birth. And to be able to do that, you need to have a diver or a free diver because you need to target that specific animal. And uh, also, hammerheads are very difficult to fish, the scalloped hammerhead, uh, because they don't bite usually the line. And Mm -hmm. uh, the one by the line is usually smaller individuals. Right. Did they actually protect that area after the results of the paper? Yeah, they were, uh, yeah, yeah, they created the marine reserve in the mangroves and uh, on some coastal area and, and to protect the coastal habitats. And um, that helped a lot, of course. What would you say the, the most unique or surprising piece of data that you've personally been able to collect is? Um, I mean, here in, uh, I'm based in Azores since a few years. And um, here we, we've developed a totally non invasive uh, way of tagging blue sharks. Basically, uh, a free dive and put a, a collar around the neck of the shark, the free swimming shark, and we have a multi-platform sensor tag that stays on for 24 to 48 hours on the shark, recording the depth, salinity, acceleration. Uh, we even have an onboard camera. And then we recover the, the tag, download the data, and deploy again. And with that, we, we could really see the, the daily routine of these blue sharks. Uh, so basically, all day they go up and down the water column from zero to 400 meters to hunt. Then they come back at the surface to re-eat and then again and again. And that's something we never experienced before. We couldn't um, get this kind of data uh, in another way. And it was really interesting to see uh, their daily behavior because we were seeing these sharks every day on shark dives, but we had no idea what they were doing. So, I mean, you're obviously a big proponent for this non-invasive or minimally yes. invasive techniques. Yes. Is this something that you're training other people to do? Can people reasonably expect that they might be able to learn to do what you do? I mean, let's face it, you're a world record holder. What you do underwater is perhaps not achievable so much by most no, people. No, no, because in fact, you don't need to be a super good free diver. You need to be good with the animal, understand how it works. But the actual time we spend on the water to tag a shark, it's maybe 30, 40 seconds. It's very short time. That sure sounds like it. 
So we started this podcast with the question of, you know, can we truly study sharks without killing them? Now, there might be some case for mortality within shark research, but what is your opinion? Yeah, it's like everything. Huh? I mean, science, uh, is, there will be always invasive thing in science and moreover in biology. Uh, but I think we can limit the impact and uh, the, the way we tag them and, and, and the species we target. We know there are sharks that are very fragile. Some other sharks are like bulletproof. If you work with bull sharks, they, they can stay a long period of time uh, being investigated. But uh, I'm, I'm an advocate for the, the less invasive possible methodology. And that's why somehow I started doing the shark tagging, because I thought free divers or divers could help to do that and minimizing the impact on the animal. So there you have it. We've heard from two industry professionals who found really innovative ways, non-lethally and non-invasively, to gather data from sharks. I think our need for information as scientists has kind of been leveraged by some of these special interest groups. You know, these fishing tournament organizers who say, we're going to go out and catch sharks and donate the carcasses to science to further our understanding of the species. Well, isn't it time that we say, no, we don't want your dead sharks anymore? We've already got that information and we're developing techniques that don't require lethality anymore. So let's take away that media talking point that they have and the justification for really what they're doing, which is just making money off of dead sharks. Both Fred and Neil pointed out that in many ways, we don't need lethal take anymore. And in fact, any type of interaction with the sharks that's invasive is at least non-desirable and perhaps unnecessary. You know, we have over the years learned a lot from dead sharks, but I think it's finally time to say, we don't need your dead shark anymore. It's time for today's Shark Bite, where our researcher Sierra brings us a cool ocean fact to end the show. What have you got for us today, Sierra? Yeah, so I know we just finished chatting with Neil and Fred about how they tag and study sharks, but there's actually this program out there where a lot of people who aren't scientists or marine biologists do a lot of the tagging. Very cool. Let's hear about it. Yeah, so it's the Citizen Science Program. It's called the Cooperative Shark Tagging Program. It's one of the longest running and largest operations of shark tagging in the world. And it's this huge effort between recreational anglers, commercial fishers, biologists, and NOAA fisheries. Sounds great. So what type of tags are they putting in? So there's two main types that they use. The first is the DART or M tag, which is usually used by fishers. And then there's the thin or roto tag, which is usually used by the biologists. Yeah, so those are fairly basic ID tags that enable you to see if, if a fish has been captured before and tagged, and then you can enter that into the database as a recapture. That's pretty cool. What are they finding? So since 1962, there have been almost 300,000 sharks tagged. And one of the crazy things that they found from this was that tiger sharks actually crossed the Atlantic. They didn't find this or discover this until third, the program was 34 years old. Oh, wow. So they obviously they tagged a tiger shark and it got recaptured across the other side of the Atlantic. Yep. That's awesome. Uh, tell me the name of the program again. It's the Cooperative Shark Tagging Program. Okay, so if you're fishing and you're catching shark, then you really should be part of this program because obviously some really good scientific data can come from it. Thanks so much, Sierra. Yeah, anytime. Okay, that's it for another Shark Week, the podcast. Thank you for joining me. And I really want to thank my guests, Neil and Fred. We really learned a lot from you today, guys. Until next time, I'm Luke Tipple. I'll chat to you soon. Listening to the Shark Week podcast.